I'm Estradios Gavis. I am a professor at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. I am also a Ph.D. student at uh, Brooklyn Polytechnic, where I'm working on hardware security and various other random things, forensics, anonymity, um, kind of annoying my professor in general. But um, uh, so my talk is on asymmetric defense. It's kind of my experience and the experience of running a small, unfunded IT shop, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. Um, the, the kind of the, the gist of this, this talk is that if you're running a small shop, um, you, you don't have the necessary resources and um, time and people and all that to, to do what is supposed to be done properly. Uh, at, at the Merchant Marine Academy, we compete in this cyber defense exercise. And uh, in that, there's you know, other DOD academies and, and stuff like that. They got lots of funding. They do a great job. They, uh, they can follow proper procedures and all that. At the Merchant Marine Academy, we're kind of left to our, our own. We don't get any funding. We're kind of um, we're out there by ourselves. So uh, this is kind of my experience in, in teaching the students try to, try to like, get the best, for, best bang for their buck and, and all that sort of stuff. We, we do, in general, break a lot of what is considered to be best practices. Um, that's because best practices are generally designed for, for programs and places that, that have resources and time and, and money and, and where there's a buy-in from, the, from whatever administration for security and do, doesn't just look at it as a uh, kind of an excess unnecessary space so so if you have if you're in that group which I, I I'm guessing some people are so um, what I hope that you take away from this is that simplicity is the only way you're gonna get by if you try to make it complicated if you try and uh, make it you know buy in some solutions that you don't really understand you're not gonna be more secure you're gonna spend more money you're gonna be more confused um, but you're not going to be more secure. You need to understand what you have and, and do it well. If you, if you can't provide a service you understand, then don't provide that service, I guess, or really s try to figure out um, a simple solution for that. It, it, it's key. It's very key that you, you get it um, to the, the basic possible uh, configurations. So, and don't be afraid of your systems, right? You know, a lot of people, a lot it's often easy to kind of be intimidated by the equipment or a vendor's telling you not to mess with it. If a vendor's telling you not to mess with his equipment, then dump the vendor and get it, you know, put in something else. So, a little more about the academy. Um, it, it was established to train merchant mariners. Most people don't know what the hell a merchant marine is. Um, they're, you know, they're the guys that run those big giant ships, you know, the ones that ferry and all of that crap that you buy and you know so um, they're, they're under the Department of Transportation which is different than the other academies they're either the other academies are under DOD and DHS and um, it's the smallest of the five service academies um, in that you know you've heard of West Point you've heard of Annapolis you haven't heard of uh, Merchant Marine Academy unless of course you're in the shipping industry then then you know what the hell they are um, they, they'll graduate and they'll go on to do um, various things, the standard kind of life of, of a merchant marine um, is to come through the academy and uh, end up as a Navy Reserve, but they'll, they'll end up in Coast Guard or whatever, active duty. Um, this year we had um, an additional, we had some foreign participation in this cyber defense exercise, which was nice. Uh, the, the Royal Military College of Canada, we got to, got to participate. They're, they're a really good group of people. And in general, all of the, the people that participate are really great. There's a lot of sharing and a lot of kind of support for uh, amongst all of the academies. Even though we razz each other, you know, even though we think that you know, maybe Coast Guard Academy isn't so great, but uh, um, we, we do actually support one another. And, and it is a, it's a good environment. Uh, I'm glad that the academy is participating. It's, it's a good learning experience. So we have postgraduate schools, we have uh, and un undergraduate schools. The postgraduate schools don't participate in the, the prize per se, but they're just there to kind of lead the bar and whatnot. So 
the, in the CDX, the, the midshipmen were responsible for setting up all sorts of mock enterprise systems. They're given a budget, and the, that budget was to reflect not only the cost of, say, hardware, but also the cost of labor to administer that particular service. For instance, you, we, we couldn't just say, hey, it's a free, a free um, virus scanner, a free, a free um, firewall on every single workstation because these workstations are supposed to represent hundreds or thousands of, of computers. So it, wouldn't, it would be unreasonable to kind of walk around and administer them individually. So they were trying to reflect the costs of, of a, a large group and, and various other things along those lines. So even though uh, the products, uh, all of the products are, are open source generally, uh, and therefore, or, or free, uh, they're not free to implement, not free to uh, use. They do have a cost in terms of operational costs. Uh, and then they have to try and administer this network that they, they were given after they, try, after they cleaned it up and um, uh, during a live exercise where the NSA is attacking them. Uh, they're also, in that same time, they're, they're given these injects where they have to do various things, change DNS configurations, um, res respond to a general's orders or something along those lines. Uh, and, and the standard reporting mechanisms, you know, to say, we're under attack at this point, we want to block these IPs. So the, they're trying to model the, the CDX as closely as possible to, uh, to what you might find in, in kind of a real world experience. We want to get as, as good of a, a practice as possible for the, for the midshipmen and cadets. So. This is kind of the, this is our network. This is by far the simplest of the networks that were out there. And again, this kind of goes to, the, to the, the, the idea that I'm trying to push here is that you want simplicity if you don't have the manpower. Um, you can't probably see any of this, which is, which is okay. This is just a general network. We have over here, uh, we, we pile on, we have our, our routing and our external DNS over here. Um, and then internal, we have an AD over here with an internal DNS, so we're separating those two out. And then over here, we pile on all of our services into one, one machine, and we're, we kind of lock that down as, as best we can. Um, we have our web server, our IM, and our database all over there. And we separate it out over from the rest of the network. So we have a, a VLAN switch over here and some monitoring, a little monitoring station over there. So some of the cost trade-offs that, that we went through, or the midshipmen went through, were in saying we could have had multiple machines and multiple um, servers, but from an administrative point of view, uh, at any given point, we might only have one, one midshipman, one student in, in the shop at watching the network. Uh, so again, you can't really have, well you could, but it, it, we found it, it would probably easier to just concentrate everything onto one box. Yeah, it puts all of our eggs in one basket, and yeah, it's kind of risky, but if you're running a shop with just one person, you're, you're kind of living in a risky world anyway, so um, it, it's, again, not necessarily the best of plans for everyone, but it is, it's a solution for, for keeping these costs down. Um, it keeps monitoring down, keeps administration down. You don't have to worry about trying to patch a number of different machines. You can just focus on the one machine and make sure that's running very well. Um, so we made some mistakes, obviously. We had some uh, last minute course corrections, and we'll talk about those a little later, but primarily we started off using a lot of these GUI interfaces to do the administration and all that, and then we ultimately transitioned to using FreeBSD for most of the, uh, most of the infrastructure. So just to uh, kind of get you a, an overview of some of the other things that we covered here is um, it's good to learn multiple operating systems. And again, I'm not, I'm not really saying anything that's earth shattering here. I'm just trying to get a basic understanding of, of IT and, and security out to everyone here. And to say that learning multiple operating systems is important. You, you want to know more than just Windows. You want to be able to say, have more than one tool in your bag. You want to, uh, you know, there, there's multiple tools out there and you should, you should, understand, you should understand them. FreeBSD, Ubuntu, uh, Gen2, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. 
Um, so kind of play around with them. Don't put them in production until you're comfortable with them, but get, get out there and just play with it. You know, I'm sure everyone has a, an old machine out there that they can play with and they can start messing around with, uh, and you certainly should do so. Uh, when you feel comfortable, you can roll it into production. Um, that, that's kind of, you know, again, not, not rocket science, just keep it simple. You want to keep it simple. Uh, NSA puts out a bunch of pretty good guides on how to secure a number of different things. Uh, what they don't do is they don't keep the URL very consistent, so I'm, I'm not certain if this is still the one. They, they refer to it as the snack and various other things, and um, so they should probably solidify on one URL or at least redirect from the old ones. So uh, you can usually find them if you dig around on the, on the website anyway. Um, so even though I, I'm a big proponent of Linux and I use it for as, you know, as much as I can, you can't as an administrator ignore Windows. Uh, it's just the, the, the world we live in and, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good operating system for what it does or, um, and that is it keeps people comfortable in, in an environment where they've been for some time. Uh, we use uh, group policies. Make sure you use that obviously if you're running a network. Um, use an, an AD and, and join it into uh, a, you know, a group. So the group policies will allow you to administer a number of the workstations at the same time and you're not walking around to each one and you can push them down all at the same, all at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff. But don't get too carried away with it because there's a tendency to, at least when you, when you leave midshipmen to sh lock down a network or you, or you get kind of all excited about uh, security, you start locking everything down and then pretty soon none of your users can do anything. So, and you know, you want to make sure that you're, you're locking it down but not so that it's completely unusable. And in terms of um, other Windows, primarily, the primary OS that, Windows OS that they used in this exercise was uh, XP and, um, but we did have a little, some Vista in there and it was okay. From a security point of view, it actually is okay. From everything else, kind of not so good, I don't think. So uh, Windows 7 seems to be doing uh, better in a lot of, the, uh, in a lot of other ways. Um, so hopefully it will continue to get better. So, so you want to, again, keep the, the tools simple. What, you know, we found troubles, we wanted to track them down. System, sys internals, uh, are free tools. You can you can download them. You can use them. They're great. Process explorers let you see what's going on. And even you know what's important when you're administering a network, or you're, you have to understand what your baseline is. What is good versus what is not good. So get a good machine, a machine that you trust, one that you just built and you know isn't owned, and just look at look at what it looks like normally with Process Explorer. What's the normal network traffic that it generates and 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 kind of get a feel for that. Once you're comfortable in there, then you can start noticing, well, this is kind of not behaving well. It seems slower than normal. It, it's, it has too many processes running. I didn't, you know, I don't know what these are. So it, it kind of gives you a, um, it, it's helpful in, in getting you a baseline. Uh, firewalls, you want to use kind of, the internal one is good. Core Force, if you're familiar with it, is really good. It can really lock everything down. It can really lock everything down, and it's a it's a very it's a very solid product. Um, but it can also make everything completely unusable too. So again, you don't want to get uh, you don't want to get too carried away with it. Uh, the uh, uh, antivirus stuff is obviously a no-brainer as well. You want to run that, but don't get too carried away with these scans. Uh, I've I've seen these uh, administrations set up so that it's scanning like all files all the time. It just thrashes the hard drive the entire day and um, you're really not any more secure. You know? If it's scanning the whole day, you're still not going to be protected from your zero days. You're still not going to be catching like every single, uh, every single vulnerability. So you've got to keep it all in perspective. You, you, you don't want to get too carried away with tools that are that aren't really designed to catch everything instantaneously. So keep it under, you know, keep it reasonable. If, you're, if the hard drive is thrashing, it's going to be the number one uh, reason why your, your users are going to complain because their system is slow because it, their hard drive is like spinning all the time. Um, I wanted to say a few things about passwords. Um, 
past phrases is what I, what I advocate. Past phrases are, are like long phrases. They can be gibberish phrases. They can be um, sensible phrases, even although that's not ideal. If you choose, like, say, four or five different words that are somewhat related in your mind, uh, you, you build a past phrase. Uh, that's a lot better than a password that's just a random letter. Uh, random letters. You can make passwords very long in that way. You can easily get a 20 or 30 character password. Uh, and, and in terms of password security, you know, size does matter. So you want to do that. Um, so passphrases, you know, and it also keeps it easier to remember. And don't get too crazy with swapping out the passwords. I know there's some requirements out there that you have to change your passwords every 90 days and all that. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that's actually making us more secure, but if you have to follow that, at least try and make it as uh, painless as possible. Uh, you can remember a sentence a lot better than you can rem remember jumbled words. So you don't, you don't need, even need to necessarily advocate the funny characters and all that sort of stuff, although that's a good idea. In terms of a small network, if you're, if you're building a network, you have this option only in small networks. If you, you want to build Real, real networks or VLANs. I like VLANs. I think having a switch that you that's centrally managed that you can uh, that you can control a bunch of different ports on is a good idea. It doesn't have to be crazy expensive. You can get um, you know a, a very reasonable gigabit well, managed switch nowadays, you know, with a decent number of ports without breaking the bank. So uh, you should definitely look into that. But if you have a bunch of little switches lying around and you want to use them, that's cool too. You, know? uh, you, you can certainly model a VLAN and a, and a real network and a, a VLAN network all in the same thing. But not if your network is too big, right? If it's a large network, forget it. But in a small network, you can definitely get away with it. So. Um, from the application security point of view, our applications, firewalls, gateways. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple different products out there. There's a, a number of them. We, use, we played around with uh, Monowall, uh, IPCOP, Untangle, PFSense, uh, a couple others. Uh, they're pretty good. They're really good, actually. Monowall is really great, and we were actually using that all the way up until the very end when we dropped it for FreeBSD. Um, Untangle is actually a really impressive uh, and has a lot, of different, a lot of different things. Seems to be easy to administer. The, the danger in these, um, in these interfaces and these tools is that they, you don't really have a full understanding of what's going on in the background. But from a, from a learning point of view, they're very good. They, they do the basic configurations and you can kind of get a, a sense of what is there and how a, a system should be set up. And so then when you, in our case, when the students migrated off onto the FreeBSD system, ultimately, they had a better understanding, they felt more comfortable with, the, uh, with the, the system in general. So that when they moved to the FreeBSD, there wasn't any problems. Uh, they understood what was going on. Um, so check these out. They're all very good. They're all, all free. You can all download them and check them out and play with them. Uh, on the application side, we used eBox, again, all the way up until the end, and when we dropped it in favor of FreeBSD. Um, Webmin is also another possibility that's it's been around for a lot longer than eBox. It's not as pretty, but um, eBox certainly is good. Again, it sets up a lot of different things for you, and you can, you know, you can kind of get the, the, the basic setup without a lot of pain, you know? Not a lot of pain. And again, Untangle is also available in this, in this space too. Untangle is probably one of the better tools to, to kind of wrap everything up. Um, I like to kind of diversify a little bit. So if you're going to do it for your, your routing and all that sort of stuff, then I'd probably try to pick something else um, just to kind of get a little diversity. If, there's an, if there is a vulnerability in, in the UI and the environment, then you might, have your, you might have yourself in a, in a lot of trouble. Unless, of course, you're concentrating it all onto one box and then, you know, again, you know, you, you have a single, you know, you get a single point of failure anyway, you might as well at least make your administration, your administrative abilities easy. So, so the, at, at the academy we did in, in good spirits of, the, of what the government can do was we hired a Russian to help us out. So. Um, Boris is one of the guys at the, uh, uh, at the 
at Poly, and he's a kind of a FreeBSD freak, and so he um, really understands what's going on and, and is comfortable and happy to teach and kind of help other out. So he, we brought him in, and in short order, uh, a day or two, he had the midshipmen kind of convinced that, hey, FreeBSD is the way for them. They felt comfortable based off of what they had done with the other tools, the FreeBSD, with the um, with MonoWall and PFSense and all that, that they they didn't uh, feel too burdened by by the by FreeBSD. So don't be afraid of it. Um, so in comparison of the two, when we got to it, we couldn't do a, a few things. Um, the natting was a little more difficult or it was simpler under FreeBSD. All of these things we could do with the other environment uh, except the split DNS environment. We wanted to s segment the DNS environment and uh, it wasn't as easy to do in, free, in, in eBox and um, mono wall. We couldn't quite get that working right. Under FreeBSD, obviously the, those sort of things are, are somewhat easy to do. So um, there's lots of good guides out there and um, you know you can do this. Uh, free, uh, FreeBSD is you can do you can route to VLANs, you can do all sorts of stuff like that. It's, it's very good. We, we also use an environment of PF and IPFW so that we have a better blend of uh, for natting and for firewalling, um, and that's just a, a comfort. You know, one one syntax is easier to understand than the other. So, um, FreeBSD we also did for the application server. We replaced eBox. eBox is really great again up until the point where we're like, well, we're not quite certain how we want to uh, set it up. So, uh, during the actual gameplay, we moved the we moved the eBox down to the backup machine and we move FreeBSD into our, our primary machine. So uh, obviously setting up the web server and email and database and Jabber, which is the IM client for those of you who don't know. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, again, you know, you shouldn't be too, you don't be afraid of FreeBSD. So in general, uh, like I said, I, what I wanted to get across here is, a, you know, we have a quick talk. I had a quick talk. So. We want to keep it as simple as possible. We don't want it to be complicated. If you don't understand it, it's not secure at all. Um, security is not about uh, one thing. You need to jump in, get your feet wet, and, and, and really start understanding what's going on. If you don't understand it, it's not good. Don't panic, just do it, right? Um, so that's more or less the, what I was trying to get across. If, if you uh, if you're out there, you hack boats or you hack students or something, let me know. I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, and I'm, all, I'm always willing to listen to su suggestions if you think you have a better idea in terms of small network administration. Um, it's always welcome. I hope everyone enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Thanks.